Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the opening program of the 2018-19 New York Arts local chapter season. And before I introduce our guest speaker tonight, Ryan Barna, I just wanted to mention that one of the longtime supporters of ARS passed away back in late June, Richard Benson. You may remember seeing him come in with his assistant, and he would sit in the back usually with a walker. What a lot of people don't know about him was that he was very generous in donating money to ARSC, as well as to the New York Philharmonic, Boston Symphony, the Metropolitan Opera, and the New York Public Library. Um, he was the one responsible for the uh, New York Phil 20 years ago getting those very early Bell Lab electrical tests that were discovered. And he was very generous in giving money for preservation work uh, with the New York Philharmonic and the New York Public Library and the Boston Symphony. He'll be sorely missed. Uh, there may be something happening concerning some funding that he bequeathed, but we're not sure yet what is going to be happening with that that may continue some of the work that he wanted to see. Uh, he'll be sorely missed. He was an absolute gentleman. I knew him for over 20 years. And he beat the odds health-wise on something uh, 20 years ago that his nurse who would come with him said he's the only one that had survived from what he had had for 20 years where most people had a prognosis of three. Uh, a remarkable man. He told me when he was 11 years old, his older brother uh, took him to, uh, to the high school in Toronto and they interviewed Sir Thomas Beecham when he came to conduct the Messiah in Christmas time around 1939. Well, rest in peace, Richard. Thank you again. Anyway, tonight we are presenting a rather interesting program by Ryan Barna, and it's called Your Grand Old Rag, George M. Cohan, Bill Murray, and the History of Your Grand Old Flag. It took a rewrite, a world war, and a blockbuster film to solidify Your Grand Old Flag as an American patriotic standard. First written in 1906 and introduced in the Broadway musical George Washington Jr. as Your Grand Old Rag, the song could have met an early demise had it not been for a popular phonograph singer whose records prevented the song from fading. While the song initially met with minor outrage in referencing the flag as a rag, the phonograph records by Billy Murray selected for the National Recording Registry in 2003 remained on sale long after copies of the sheet music went out of print, despite receiving public objections of their own. Let me just tell you about Ryan Barna, who is our host tonight, is a Grammy-nominated album, uh, excuse me, what is, okay, excuse me, is a Grammy-nominated album notes writer who specializes in early popular music and acoustic recordings in America. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in English writing from the University of Colorado at Denver. He formerly served as a park guide with the National Park Service, including Rocky Mountain National Park and the home of Franklin D. Roosevelt. His book contributions include ABC Clio's Music in American Life and has been uh, written, and has written for Ars Journal, Vintage Jazz Mart, and In the Groove. His liner notes for Archeophone's uh, records include Songs of the Night, Dance Recordings by Joseph C. Smith's Orchestra, 1916 to 25, which he was nominated in the Best Album Notes category for the 58th Annual Grammy Awards. He is the webmaster of the Billy Murray website, www.denvernightingale.com. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Barna. Hi, everyone. As I was preparing a write-up about this song as an essay for the National Recording Registry, I couldn't help but notice how similar the story is, particularly to the outrage in the news recently when it comes to respecting the anthem and the flag. Well, whatever opi your opinion is about the news lately, public outrage over flag loyalty is nothing new. It particularly grew during the Civil War era. And Your Grand Old Flag is a song we hold in high regard. And it's one that we've held in high regard for so long, we don't realize it had such a controversial beginning. And nowadays, when you go to a band concert, uh, you're likely to find it on a 
program of other patriotic songs such as A Star Spangled Banner or The Stars and Stripes Forever. Uh, there are many sound recordings and it's become so embedded in our culture. I just want to show you a couple examples of how this song um, has been publicized with just within the last decade and it's still it, even today it's still going strong like for example here's a children's book that had come out uh, just a few years ago it's got the lyrics in it but it also has illustrations and it's got the song and a little bit of the history behind the song as well and this is Rebecca an American girl doll who wants to be an actress and look at some of the accessories that she has. Now, I don't, I'm not sure if some of you can see this from a distance, but <laughs> right here, they got the little phonograph, and with it comes a set of records, and in the front there, it says, your grand old flag, George M. Cohan. <laughs> and look, she's got the sheet music for it. And it, it looks a lot like the original does. Does it play? Does it play the record? It actually does. <laughs> um, but this is what the song means to us. This is how much it means to us. And not only did it require some rewriting uh, re as well as having to be introduced, or I should say reintroduced over and over again, the phonographs records themselves played a role in helping keep the song in public memory. But first let's learn a little bit about how the song evolved. March 2nd, 1905. Little Johnny Jones plays at the Victoria Theater in Dayton, Ohio. Little Johnny Jones was the musical in which he had introduced the Yankee Doodle Boy. What I did was I combined two sources here. This could have been the date, March 2nd, in which he came up with the idea of your grand old rag. He stated in an interview with the Yale Current that he got the song when he was traveling uh, in Dayton, Ohio. Now, we kind of have to leave a little bit of wig uh, wiggle room here just in case he might have misremembered, but if that happens to be the place where he first got the idea, what I did was I went through the New York Clipper and I got his itinerary, and this was a date in which little Johnny Jones was played uh, in Dayton. So just think for a moment, this is probably the date in which he might have come up with the idea. It very well could have been. While I was researching this, I discovered this interview that dates from 1928. And I've never seen this interview quoted anywhere else. I have not seen it in any recent musical encyclopedia or in any book about him, but it's such a fascinating story in how he tells it. He tells it in such vivid detail here. And this was just, this is just an example of one of the many newspapers that uh, the story had been printed in. But I'll read it to you in George M. Cohan's own words. A group of us touring in one of those button up the back motor cars in 1905 stopped for a drink of water at a GAR home. GAR is Grand Army of the Republic. It's a home for veterans. And then he hears this voice call out to him. Hey, Bob, come here. I heard those words shouted at me as I raised a gourd to my lips. Looking over the rim, I saw an old veteran sitting alone under a crabapple tree. One leg stuck straight out before him. It was wood. One sleeve was empty. His lone hand was upraised and his trigger finger was crooked at me. Why, Bob, you look real young, like just as I did before Gettysburg, when I had all my bones. I, I kind of want to show you something. Maybe then you'll know what a great country we fought for. Bob, follow me. He started toward the main building of the home. I followed him. He took me into the cool and silent trophy room where mementos of 61 were kept. Right here, just help me open this case, bub, 
he said as he clumped his way to a corner where a huge box stood. We tugged at the handle and the door opened. He reached within and, help me take it out, Bob. It, it mustn't touch the floor. It's, it's sort of sacred. Together, we lifted out one of the regimental colors carried by Grant's armies. Look it. See those holes? The flag was covered with bullet holes. Lovingly, his trem trembling hand caressed the folds of that flag. This here was carried at Gettysburg, son. I was color bearer of my regiment when Pickett's charge began. I was still color bearer, son, when Pickett failed. But I, well, the flag and me got hit a bit. That's why me and this, this grand old rag live at the home now. He turned dimming eyes on me as he whispered, I don't regret nothing, the arm, the leg. I don't need them no ways. Besides, he turned his gaze to the colors again and whispered, you're a grand old rag. What an idea. What an idea, he thought, for a song. George never heard anybody express the colors of the flag in that manner before. It inspired him. And throughout his road tour, he began composing the lyrics to it and thinking about how he would introduce it. On May 24th, 1905, George M. Cohen copyrighted the script, uh, excuse me, in which uh, he, had, he wrote the script for George Washington Jr. and it was received by the copyright office on that date. That's the date in which the script was received by the copyright office. Uh, and then on January 19th, 1906, you're a grand old rag was copyrighted by George M. Cohan's publisher, Frederick R. Allen Carey Mills. If you don't know who Carey Mills is, he was also a very popular songwriter um, around the turn of the century. He's most uh, well known for at a Georgia camp meeting, but also Red Wing, which he wrote years later. Well, George trusted uh, Carey Mills with the publications of his songs. And that was the address that he gave his copyright as, 48 West 29th Street, and that's the address that appears on the sheet music, too. And that is the original sheet music that was deposited in the Library of Congress for copyright. And the first line of the original chorus went as such, you're a grand old rag, you're a high-flying flag. So, a few days after it was copyrighted, on January 24th, 1906, George Washington Jr. premiered at the Court Square Theater in Springfield, Massachusetts. That was the first public performance of Your Grand Old Rag. And the reviews were positive. For example, from the New York Clipper, George Washington Jr., January 24th, was given its first production on any stage. The general opinion here is that Mr. Cohen has maintained in this work his winning gait in playwriting, and the big audience present on the opening, light, uh, opening night laughed heartily at the witty lines and clever features he has provided. It is full of action and color, and the music, particularly one number called The Grand Old Rag, was capital. So initially, the, the reviews were positive. And from that point on, the play George Washington Jr. played in New Haven, Connecticut. And then towards the end of January, it went to Philadelphia. And again, the reviews were very positive, like this one from the New York Telegraph. The best of a dozen rousing songs is by unanimous decision, The Grand Old Rag the successor to I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. The theme of the melody is Auld Lang Syne. And at the opening performance in Springfield, the audience responded to the song as one man jumping to their feet and cheering uproariously. So at this point, they knew that 
the grand old rag was going to be a success. And if a song was, had a lot of promise of becoming a hit, you can make a phonograph record of it. So, going to the next one. On February 6, 1906, Billy Murray records your grand old rag for the Victor Talking Machine Company in Philadelphia. Now, he could have made a couple of other recordings of the song a little bit earlier and a little bit later, but that's the date in which he had made the Victor record, February 6. That happens to be the same date in which George M. Cohan was playing in Philadelphia. So you have to wonder, did Billy Murray stay late for an evening performance? He could have gone to see George Washington Jr. before it uh, went to New York. Now, how did Billy Murray get a hold of that song? That's something that's been a little bit lost to time. Um, there is anecdotal evidence that Billy Murray knew George M. Cohan, but this was like a little bit later on. Um, I can tell you definitely one thing that Billy Murray knew Cohan's publisher, Carrie Mills. In fact, he had performed um, at a concert in which uh, Carrie Mills not only organized, but in which he was present at. So that is an indication that uh, Carrie Mills knew Billy Murray and he knew some of Carrie Mills' staff members, like for example, uh, William Redman. Now, almost nobody alive today knows who William Redman is, but he was also a very early recording artist, and he worked with Billy Murray frequently. He was also a staff singer at Carrie Mills, so it could have been through Carrie Mills or his, or one of his friends, uh, William Redman, which he might have acquired the song. And I say that he might have done it on commission too, because it was very rare for all these competing phonograph companies to assign the same popular song to the same artist. I mean, if you look through the list of song titles all these companies issued in the artist, they were just all over the place. But with Billy Murray, it was fairly consistent. So that Billy Murray was allowed to record his own material just as long as he got the final approval for it. So that's Kind of a hint there, he might have done it on commission. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna play as uh, it, uh, the original phonograph record as it was done on this day, February 6, which happens to be done in the same city as uh, George Washington Jr. was being played. So here is the original version of Your Grand Old Rag. This track one. Feeling comes a stealing, and it sets my brain a reeling when I'm listening to the music of a military band. Any tune like Yankee Doodle simply sets me off my noodle. It's that patriotic something that no one can understand. Way down south in the land of cotton, melody untiring. Ain't that inspiring? Hurrah, hurrah, we'll join the Jubilee. And that's going some for the Yankees by gum. Red, white, and blue, I am for you. Honest, you're a grand old rag. You're a grand old rag. You're a high-flying flag. And forever in peace may you wave. You're the emblem of the land I love, the home of the free and the brave. Every heart beats true under red, white, and blue, where there's never a boast or brag. But your old acquaintance be forgot, keep your eye on the grand old rag. So... February 12th, 1906, George Washington Jr. begins its Broadway run at the Herald Square Theater. And this, as you see here, this is a little excerpt of the review the New York Times printed. And it says, particularly the last sentence, that's about as 
<laughs> as much praise as it gets. A large audience saw the production and seemed to be pleased with it. This was, you know, this was before the days of Brooks Atkinson, who used to write very detailed reviews of Broadway shows. But no, this is, this is the review it got the following day. So that's it. So up to this point, th there doesn't seem to be much of a problem until a few days later. To the editor of the New York Times, I want to protest through your columns against a song entitled The Grand Old Rag, now being sung at one of the theaters. I think a protest should be honored against such an inept and offensive designation of the Stars and Stripes. But what's one bad apple? I mean, so were they going to, by, by this time, Billy Murray was making mm, probably most of the masters for the major phonograph companies at this point. And of course, sheet music copies were also selling. Were they gonna do anything at this point? Nope, they were just gonna keep it in production. In fact, around this time, according to the New York Telegraph, by this time, which would be mid-February, the sheet music had an advanced sale of a quarter of a million copies. It was doing very well considering calling the flag a rag, but still, it was doing very well. A few months later, April 1906, the very first records of your grand old rag were appearing on the market. And this is a page from the Victor Records supplement in which consumers could get a copy of. They can see what new records were being issued every month. And notice, Towards the bottom, the particular last, particularly the last sentence. The title seems at first glance to be semi-disrespectful, but the song will be found intensely patriotic and is the same clever mixture of American airs and eccentric comedy flashes as was its predecessor, the Yankee Doodle Boy. So already news was getting out that, well, this... You know, it may be disrespectful to be calling the flag a rag, but also just based on the title, just looking at that title that says the grand old rag, you're probably thinking, well, it's a song about an old ragtime song. But no, it was really a patriotic number. And of course, I don't think you can get all of this, but eventually I'll make these slides available. Um, what I did was I listed out all the issues in which Murray had made records for. American, Columbia, Edison, International, and of course Victor and Zonophone. There's only one exception. Leeds and Catlin got the baritone Arthur Collins to do this song. Now, of course, Murray didn't do a whole lot of recording for Leeds and Catlin, possibly because he might have been too busy recording for the other companies. But, of course, he wasn't barred from the studio. I mean, he participated in a couple minstrel sketches roughly around the same time, about 1906 and 07. So um, it wasn't like he was barred from it, but maybe they found Arthur Collins to be more conveniently available, so they got him to do it. And, of course, the Imperial label and some of the issues that um, it is derived from, uh, of course, it's much harder today than finding... Um, but of course, Billy Murray's versions, which are much easier to find. So on April 21st, 1906, George Washington Jr. closes after 10 weeks on Broadway to work on his summer revival of The Governor's Son. Now, he retires the show just temporarily, although he would reintroduce it later and later around... 1908 or so, he would assign another company and other actors to go on tour around the country and perform George Washington, Jr. Well, by June 1906, the Victor Supplement printed, Murray's record of this Cohan hit has outsold every selection in the Victor catalog, and that is saying quite a good deal. 
It is certainly a fine specimen of songwriting, singing and recording, and we congratulate Mr. Cohan, Mr. Murray, the Victor Laboratory, and the public. Just imagine. I mean, what else was in the catalog? I mean, are we thinking the Star Spangled Banner, Sousa Marches, Caruso? Nope. It was Cohan and Murray. At this point, it had outsold, they're saying it had outsold every record in the catalog. But here's a problem. Cohan, I couldn't find any news reference prior to June 1906 other than that little New York Times letter that was printed. But he must have still gotten some private objections to calling the flag a rag. So what he did was he submitted two copies of a newly revised version to Library Congress for copyright. They were received on May 31st and were given a copyright date of June 2nd, 1906. That is the sheet music cover of the new version. In fact, it's also the same one that was deposited in the Library of Congress. And it contained a line a new line in the chorus, and it goes, you are a grand old flag, though you're torn to a rag. Which, if you think about it, kind of stretches it out a little bit to the point where it kind of weakens um, the chorus. Now, why did he do this? Well, I've, they say, well, he, of course, he does say that he got several, several objections to it, even though I couldn't really find that much prior to June 1906. But the answer to that might have, not, might be in an interview from September 1906. And this is as close to the period as I could find of him stating exactly why he did it. This was not some fond recollection that he did many years later. And of course, Cohan, like many stage stars at the time, weren't, weren't always quite so good at keeping their story straight. Um, but this was as close to, your, to the period as I could find him saying in first person. He states, well, to tell you the truth, I had written this song with every sincere feeling in my heart toward my country and what that flag meant. I realized that some people might take offense at my calling the stars and stripes a grand old rag. Then the Massachusetts chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution met in Boston and passed a resolution condemning my use of the words grand old rag and demanded that I supplement the word flag. They had no complaint to make about the song, but their proposition was this. The song is being introduced in all the public schools and we want to keep up the highest ideals of American citizenship among the children. Ah, so now, now you see, the key here was the sheet music sales. And if he, he could get the approval of some of these people complaining about that song and sell more sheet music copies, especially if they were now being introduced in the schools, it was a better business decision. He didn't make any money on the phonograph record, so that wouldn't come until 1909 when they passed... Um, new copyright legislation. But that, at this point, I mean, the phonograph companies just did record whatever songs they wanted. They weren't restricted. But even by this time, by the time he had rewritten the song um, and retitled it as Your Grand Old Flag, he reported that he had already sold over half a million copies. So despite b calling the flag a rag, there doesn't seem to have been a whole lot of outrage, but it seems like he changed it to satisfy a few objectors, but also to be able to sell even more copies of the sheet music. The phonograph record in which Billy Murray had made also got criticism of its own. And this was after he, uh, George M. Cohan had rewritten the song, but still, there were other groups making the news saying that they were outraged at it, but it seems like the news didn't quite spread that far out very much. 
and some people were probably still looking at old copies that originally said you're a grand old rag. Like for example, to the editor of the New York Times, over the way home from, over the way from my home in an otherwise quiet street on the Upper West Side, there was a family and there were, there's a family and a phonograph. Every evening at about nine o'clock when I am sitting down to read or write the family, the, the family assembles in the second floor front room, opens the windows and the phonograph begins to operate. The selections are a vile mixture of street band tunes and comic opera degenerates. The nasal tones are heard of a brutal creature who sings in disgusting doggerel about the grand old rag, meaning the, August, meaning the August flag of our union, or asked to be remembered to Herald Square with a sneaky sentiment that is nauseating. Well, now that can't be Murray. You think Arthur Collins might have, m m might have had a squeaky tone like that? Or maybe it was a very rare test pressing of Enrico Caruso singing the song. Hey, you, 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 can't, you can't prove it didn't happen. But still, I'm going to, there was still criticism about the song, The Grand Old Rag, being out there. And here's another one I'm going to read to you. This one comes from the Washington Evening Star from, Je, from July 7th, 1906. There were school teachers from the interior of Virginia, and they were visiting the seaside resort as a delegation. There were some school teachers visiting this resort in Virginia. They all stopped at the big hotel, and while they were eating their first dinner at the hotel, a huge phonograph planted in an anteroom ground out the words and music of the grand old rag song in a high squeaky tone that penetrated every corner of the dining room, not to mention the school marm's ears. Is it really, are, are they talking about Murray in this? I, well, I hope not. Um, it was the first time they'd heard the grand old rag ditty. And when they made out the words, they swooped upon the hotel manager in a body and requested demanded for that matter, that that particular phonograph record should not be poked into the talking machine again while they remained at the hotel. They told the hotel man that the words of the song and even the title thereof were shockingly disrespectful to the national emblem, and the proprietor promptly instructed the bellboy manipulating the phonograph to cut that piece out while the school teachers remained in the house. So. The phonograph record also was getting some heat as well. So, some of the there were a couple instances where new labels were being changed to reflect the song "You're a Grand Old Flag." The first among them were just instrumental medleys by Arthur Pryor's band. They're instrumentals, uh, and they're the first titles that I could find to appear on the market as "You're a Grand Old Flag." Now, of all the companies that Billy Murray sang that song for, there was only one company that I could find in which he sang a new version of it, and that happens to be Edison. And in the April 1907 catalog, it replaces the original rag to flag. And it even changed the rim description. This was kind of, this was probably how it was first viewed when it came out. It was viewed as a comic song. That's what the little description on the rim said. It said comic song. But with the new version, they changed it to patriotic song. This is the only version I have been able to find that contains your grand old flag, though you're torn to a rag. And I'll play you a little excerpt from it from um, a cylinder online. It's not quite as easy to find as the original rag version, but we'll hear how it sounds. Track two. Talk to you, honest, you're a grand old flag. You're a grand old flag, though you're torn to a rag, and forever in peace may you wave. You're the emblem. Yep, and so that's the only one I found. Now, Victor. What I don't understand is Victor had 
was pretty notorious for getting their artists to remake masters over and over. Not for the grand old flag. They kept the original 1906 master containing your grand old rag. Now what they did was instead, beginning with the September 1908 catalog, they changed the title from the grand old rag to the grand old flag. But they left the master as it was. All the other companies, including Zonophone uh, and Columbia, just left the labels as they were. So you have to wonder if <coughs> some of this outrage was going on was not quite as intense as some uh, of the more modern writers writers has been saying like all this huge outrage was going on or maybe if they were offended by that title maybe they just didn't buy the record and they they were kept in the catalog as is now here's something interesting about early about late 1908 states from about October is it possible that George M Cohan did this on film not only on film, but he would have recorded a soundtrack with it. Camerophone was a very early pioneering sound film system. What they did was they used six inch long Columbia cylinders. They were known as 20th century cylinders and they could play for three minutes. That, that was, uh, from what I found in original research, that's what they primarily used as their soundtracks. So imagine, this would have been very close to an original cast recording. Imagine George M. Cohen himself on the screen singing his two hit songs, the Yankee Doodle Boy and uh, the Grand Old Flag. And what version of the flag song was he using? Was he using um, your grand old rag or was he saying your grand old flag though you're torn to a rag? Which one? Well. Not only do we not have the film, we don't have the soundtrack either. But just imagine, this would have been, this, if this could ever be found, <clears throat> even, with the, even if we could find the soundtrack for it, we could hear George M. Cohen himself doing his two numbers. Now, he did sing on radio, on a radio broadcast in 1940, and this was many decades later. He did sing those two songs, and there is a sound recording <coughs> of it that survives, but imagine he, good chances are he might have done it on film. Now, beginning in September 1911, the Edison cylinder of your grand old flag was discontinued. Now this was coming at the very end of the two minute wax cylinder era, but it didn't seem to have sold <coughs> or have been in high demand enough to have Murray make a new version of it for some of their longer records, like um, the Wax Amberall, and of course later the, um, in the next year, the Blue Amberall. And some of those other companies he recorded for, they were out of business. American and international in particular were sued out of business for pat patent infringement. So that those two labels were gone. Um, Zonophone, was put out of business in 1912. So that, and with the emission of the Edison cylinder in 1911, um, after 1912, there were only two labels left that were carrying that song, and that was Victor and Columbia. And here's another issue that I've found as well. I have not been able to trace any sheet music copies of the grand old flag that might have been printed between 1906 and 1915. <clears throat> By the early teens, Cohen's publisher, Kerry Mills, had already changed addresses. All the co I've looked everywhere. All the copies I have seen of the grand old flag have Kerry Mills's old address on them, which would have been 48 uh, West 29th Street in New York City. And, all, and the covers themselves, they all have George M. Cohan's latest play, George Washington Jr. Well, by the early teens, Cohan had produced several other productions. So if anybody there might know of a sheet music copy that could have been printed 
<coughs> with a different address than the original, or say originally introduced um, in George Washington Jr. And this would have been before 1915. I would definitely like to know. So, which leads me to a next question: If if they <coughs> didn't update the sheet music. It, might, it may have gone out of print. Now, there's a couple ways that somebody could have gotten copies of the sheet music as late as 1912. They would have to go to their music store and hope maybe the music dealer had a back, um, had a back stock of some of those old copies. Or they could have gone to um, the school where they might have had some copies on hand or maybe Otherwise, they would probably have to get them secondhand then. But even by the early teens, it seemed like that song was fading out a little bit. Now, I did have several newspaper searches online, and occasionally I would see the song listed in school concerts, in a couple band concerts. And of course, George Washington Jr. just continued as like, <coughs> it was being played in local cities. So it wasn't really consistently being um, tour touring consistently around the United States, but it was being played just here and there. So how was the song being kept alive? Well, by 1913, there were only two labels still carrying the song. So in 1913, you could still go to a Columbia dealer or a Victor dealer and still buy Billy Murray's selection of it. Now, here's another thing. <clears throat> in 1913, by this time, there must have been a third rewrite. This is the very earliest version that, or I should say the earliest recording that I could find of this rewrite. It's from July 28th, 1913, and it contains a peerless quartet doing a menstrual record. And I had to listen to this several times. I listened to it with headphones. I had to listen carefully. And I am really positive that it uses some rewritten uh, chorus, uh, a rewritten chorus line. You're a grand old flag. You're a high flying flag. Now, I haven't found any early teen sheet music that has that, re that rewrite. Now, Victor, of course, would have been connected to the publisher, Carrie Mills, so maybe they got an updated copy from them. But this is the earliest record I could find that, can, that includes this chorus, and this is the chorus that is much, <coughs> uh, much better remembered today. In fact, it's the same chorus in which we still use nowadays. So here's the earliest recording I could find of that, thir uh, that third version. was just that short excerpt. <clears throat> November 1914, the Columbia disc of your grand old rag was discontinued. It was disappearing. So after 1914, all that remained was Victor. The only way you could get a copy of that song <clears throat> was, of course, Billy Murray's original 19. 06 Master, which still has them saying, you're a grand old rag, you're a high-flying flag. So, in 1915, the copyright to your grand old flag was transferred from Kerry Mills to Maurice Richmond. He had purchased the copyrights not only to your grand old flag, but also to the Yankee Doodle Boy, as well as other Cohen publications. <clears throat> and he did this, as he stated, not necessarily to make a profit, but 
also he he said he did it more for sentimental reasons than any expectation of realizing a profit. That's what he told the New York Clipper later on. But in 1915, the only w way you could get um, a recording of it was through Victor. And the print sheet music that you see here probably dates from around the 1917 period when it was uh, being reintroduced again. And of course it says originally introduced in George Washington Jr. But again, this wouldn't date any earlier in 1915 because on the inside title page, it says copyright transferred in 1915 to Maurice Richmond. And of course, here's an odd thing I find about that sheet music too. At the very bottom where the copyright is, it still contains Carrie Mills' old address at 48 West 29th Street. So they didn't update the address for that either. But you think that a song like this that could have, that was so popular once would have been made more available through phonograph records. Now, the, cattle, the phonograph companies kept many patriotic numbers as standard selections. Across the board, there were, you could get the Star Spangled Banner, Columbia, the Gem of the Ocean, My Country, Tis of Thee. I mean, but your grand old flag, it was just something that seemed to be fading out. So, on July 14th, 1916, Edison got together some of their studio performers and record a medley called Songs of Other Days. This was the third part to it. They were collections of older songs that they probably could not get much money for if they had released the titles individually. So what they did was they put them together as a collection of songs. But who did they pick to sing the lead in Your Grand Old Flag? Of all people, they chose Murray, the original man who had introduced it for Edison a decade earlier. And in this one, Murray sings the new chorus, you're a grand old flag, you're a high-flying flag. So that's the next track. was indeed Billy Murray singing ahead of the chorus right there. He is documented in the cash book for it. So he's anonymous, but who else would they choose? April 6, 1916, Congress passes declaration of war against Germany as requested by President Woodrow Wilson. Now, about a week and a half later, in the New York Clipper, there was an increased demand in that song. The Maurice Richmond Music Company has, during the past few weeks, received so many requests for the George M. George M. Cohan song, Your Grand Old Flag, that has been issued in professional form and orchestrations printed. A number of the singers now using it say that it is received even more enthusiastically than during the time of its popularity. So at this point, it was making a comeback. Not only was it making a comeback, but they were demanding copies of the sheet music. It's possible that they may not have been able to get them because it, either the, the music stores may have sold out of their back stock or perhaps they couldn't even get them secondhand. But the demand really increased. As you can see the date from that article, April 18th, this was just shortly after Congress declared war. And the next month, in May 1917, the New York Clipper said, judging from its enthusiastic reception, it is due for a second lease of life. So 
this song that has become so important to us was just fading into the distance. And from, from the declaration of war, it's now back into the limelight. So Vector decides to record a new version of it. On June 4th, 1917, they decided to sign a quartet, but who did they decide to pick to lead the quartet? It was none other, none other than Billy Murray. And we'll listen now to the song that, and how he sang it well over a decade after he had first introduced it on Victor. Now, of course, other companies began to release that song, too. Billy Murray was under contract with Edison and Victor, so he was not allowed to record the song for other companies. So they gave the song over to some other singers um, for some of the various labels, and I listed the newer versions that were introduced during the World War I era. And a few companies, of course, not every company, but a few companies saw that it was making a comeback, so they decided they'll have new versions of it. And on the right-hand side there is the dates in which they were first listed to the public. Now, oddly, Billy Murray also made an Edison Diamond Disc Master of the song, um, backed with a chorus. And in the Matrix Notebook, it was marked accepted, which means it was approved, but it was not issued. Now, of course, Thomas Edison himself was in charge of the recording division and decided what should be released and what shouldn't be released. And he could have rejected that song or for, for any reason. Either, there, either he had this certain ringing in this ear that he couldn't tolerate. It was known as tremolo. It was, it's like this vibration because he was near deaf. And whenever he heard that, he would automatically almost reject a record outright. Um, but no, and I've looked on in the online Edison catalog and no test pressing of it um, can be found either. But Edison did pick Billy Murray again to sing the lead of that song. Um, and then years after the war in 1923, Murray's 1906 Victor Master of your grand old rag was finally discontinued. So for a few years, you could still get both the rag and the flag version. They didn't cut either one of them out for many years until finally 1923, they decide to retire it. But you could still purchase the one he made in 1917. And you can purchase it for many years, um, even after the introduction of electrical recording. It stayed around until 1927, and then it was placed in a special catalog, which you can order from that still contains old acoustic masters. But by this time, your grand old flag was pretty much in public memory. Um, it kind of got a little bit on the backside for a while, but 
still, I mean, uh, Maurice Richmond distributed sheet music copies of that song really well, not just as individual sheet music copies, but as well as in songbooks as well. And of course, it continued to be used for band programs uh, as well as school programs. So it was still pretty much well in public memory for the years to come. And then during the World War II era, it made another comeback. But first, in May, on May 1st, 1940, the Congressional Gold Medal was awarded to George M. Cohan in belayed recognition for Over There and Your Grand Old Flag. As a document read, because of his ability to instill in the hearts of the growing citizenry a loyal and patriotic spirit for their country and what it stands for in the eyes of the world. And then in, on uh, June 6, 1942, the film Yankee Doodle Dandy was released, and that's the one that stars Jim Cagney, and that's the one in which we know very well had helped solidify that song in our memories now. And for many years after it, it was included on many LPs and 78s for the many years to come. Some um, as band numbers, some on as nostalgia pieces. But at that point, it is now in our memory, thanks to that film. Now, Billy Murray, by that time, had almost gone into retirement. He had stopped making uh, most of his commercial phonograph records by this time. He would do it one more time in 1943. And he was making occasional guest appearances on the National Barn Dance Program. Well, on August 22, 1942, at the Wisconsin State Fair, Billy Murray came out and reprised your grand old flag as he had introduced it decades earlier when that song was new. And an air check of that transcription uh, still survives. I got this from an old tape that's been circulating for many years. I don't know where the original is. I would like to know if the original might still be in a private collection or if it's in, if it's in an archive. But we can hear the man himself, Billy Murray, sing the song many years after he had first introduced it. And of course, in 2003, Billy Murray's version of Your Grand Old Flag and Your Grand Old Rag was chosen for the National Recording Registry as being significant in our culture. So what we're gonna hear is um, his last known recording of that song, which would have been in 1942, and this was done live on the air uh, when he was present at the Wisconsin State Fair. I tell you, we're not holding out a thing tonight, folks, and to prove it, here's our celebrated guest of the evening, that famous pioneer of popular American songs and phonograph records, the one and only Billy Murray. He sings a medley, but I trimmed it down a bit. This is the Yankee Doodle Boy. I'm a real life Yankee Doodle, made my name and fame and boodle, just like Mr. Doodle did by riding on a pony. I love to listen to the Dixie strain, I long to see the girl I left behind me. That ain't a Josh, she's a Yankee by gosh. Anything about a Yankee that's a phony. I'm a Yankee Doodle dandy. And there is something there. That sounds so square, it's a grand old name. You're a grand old flag, you're a high flying flag, forever in peace they wave. You're the emblem of the land I love, the home of the free and the brave. Every heart beats through on the red, white, and blue, where they Grand medley of George M. Cohan favorites. 
and I'll be happy to take whatever questions or comments you may have. Anyone? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. all of them except for one, and that was Arthur Collins, as I had known at the bottom. He was not under contract. He was a, at that point, he was a freelance studio singer, so he could have recorded for any company that wanted his services. Yep. Yes, Tim. Well, thank, thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is that the uh, record companies were very tight with the publisher. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Here in the hell of being mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So that uh, basically the uh, publishers wanted those songs recorded, not because they wanted their money from them, but mm -hmm. They could have had their hooks in it already, although it just seems so unusual based on from everything I've inspected that period for um, to have somebody like Murray record that same song, not just for Victor, but for all the companies. I mean, it just seemed unusual. I mean, if, if he, I'm thinking if he didn't um, do that song, on commission, how in the world did he manage to get assigned that song to so many different companies? I mean, you think they might have, Victor might have assigned it to Arthur Collins, but it just seems, yeah, it just seems real odd to me. So that's the only thing that I could specula speculate. But of course, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, Victor could have had their hooks in that song on, already, but it just seems so coincidental that they picked Murray, not, not just Victor, but all the all the other companies picked Murray. So, did you have anything else? Um, March of 1906. Um, it was April 1906 in which the, the record was first listed. No. I know that sometimes Victor introduced the records, I forgot which date it was during the decade, but it was either on the first of the month or like the 25th, I, I don't remember, but yeah, it was, what I gave was a listing date in which the, it, it appeared in the supplement, but it could have appeared in, in uh, phonograph stores a couple of days earlier, but yeah, I'd have to check. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I haven't found anything on that record being issued prior to April. But I'll check again, if, because I can't picture that song being uh, a, a record of that song being issued any earlier in the last week of March. But I'll check. I'll check again. Anyone else? Yes. So let me ask that, just so it's always a fallacy for you to get ignorant. Did the publishing companies dictate whether or not somebody bought the um, I'm not sure, but it, if they could sell the sheet music, I mean, that, that was a key. And sometimes if they wanted a performer to go out and help push it, they would also pay the performer as well, the publishing companies. That I know um, as well. Is yeah. Murray a popular recording artist? Yes, very popular. Um, he, he, his popular... Act, his popularity actually gained after about 1905 or so, and part of his popularity was from not just comic songs, but his interpretation of uh, George M. Cohan songs, which sold very well. So that was one of his earliest Cohan songs he introduced. The first one he, um, that Barry Murray recorded was the Yankee Doodle Boy, and that just um, took off right there as, as a great song, and that was listed in the catalog for many years. Most of them were for Victor. 
a lot of his uh, uh, a lot of his other records were also for Edison, but most of them were for Victor and Edison. But he also recorded during his freelance years for for various companies, but most of his outputs on Victor. Yes. To the publisher, uh, yes, and that came in 1909 when the copyright reform was passed. Anyone else? Peter? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I have had at least three copies of that Batwing Victor of 1917, You're a Grand Old Flag, and I've got that one copy of the RAG version, the single-sided Grand Prize Victor, I've had that for a while, and that's really the best copy that I've seen in person, I've had it for a while, but I've had at least three of the 1917 version, so that's very odd, I mean, maybe it's because of our locations, um, but in my opinion, as as time went on, more and more people bought phonographs, so they were able to um, sell more records because more people had phonographs. It just increased over time. Um, but no, it, I mean, in my territory, I've seen more copies of the Batwing, but I've also seen a number of copies of the double-sided Victor II that uh, the grand old flag, the original 1906 one, was issued on. Anyone else? Well, I appreciate everyone coming tonight. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Um, and keep your eye on the grand old flag. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Terrific program. Uh, our next meeting will be on October 18th, a month from now. It will be Dennis Rooney, who's coming up from Florida, will present a centennial tribute to the great two great Wagnerians, Astrid Varney and Birgit Nielsen. He had done a truncated version of this at the National Conference. This one will be, of course, much more expanded to fit the two hours, along with some video, if I'm correct. And some, uh, I think he found the recording of Astrid Varney's mother that he'll be able to play. So I wanna thank you all for coming, and just keep in mind that uh, the Sonic Arts Center here, you know, gives us this room every week, every month, uh, for free, and they do have a four-year course, a curriculum, in Bachelor's of Arts, a fine, a fine arts degree in music, with a concentration in music and audio technology. As I also uh, have been brought up to uh, tell you, Mr. Benson was one of our benefactors who kept us going, so any contributions you want to give to the chap local chapter will be greatly appreciated at this time. So anyway, have a good September, folks, what's left of it. We'll see you in October. And we, have, we already have the entire season planned out. We have some very interesting and unusual programs coming up. Uh, just to give you an idea, not that I'm promoting myself, but uh, November we'll be at the New York Philharmonic Archives again, a repeat of uh, what I did, what was it, almost four years ago. This is another batch of New York Philharmonic broadcast hitherto unknown to have survived. I had done this back in June for the local AES chapter and they were quite impressed and I think they want me to do a um, kind of a blog on it as well as a, uh, um, uh, a streaming, possibly, you know, talking about these recordings, the discovery of them and the sound of them and hopefully there'll be uh, more projects in the, in the offing, although that Barbara Hawes, who was the instigator of this, has now left the archive as of this past week. So it, that's going to be quite a treat. There are some unusual recordings and sound that is quite remarkable. Anyway, have a good evening. Yeah, yes, Sheldon. What years? Uh, 1938 to 1950. In fact, we get in there the uh, Western Hemisphere premiere of the Shostakovich Eighth with Rajinsky from April of 44. And then, um, oh yeah, 
one of the most magnificent renditions of the Brahms Violin Concerto with Nathan Milstein and Victor de Sabata during his first series of guest appearances in March of 1950. Those have circulated, but not in the sound that you'll hear that we were able to find. These were taken off the line, uh, off the CBS line that nobody knew about, onto 16-inch discs. So that will also be a limited invitation. We'll send something out where you'll have to respond to get on a list because there they only allow 30 people into the archive. So it'll probably be funneling through me. You'll send me an email, I'll put you down on the list, and then you'll be able to get in. Well, thank you again, Ryan, and uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, hopefully see you next month. Enjoy the nice weather I think we finally got. Maybe we'll see the sun tomorrow again for a few minutes. Have a good evening, all. Thanks again.